Hello, artist. It's Kelly Folsom here. Welcome back to the Art Life Conversations podcast. Can you believe it? We're at episode number 10. I can't believe I've done or I'm doing the 10th episode today. Yay, me. Go, me. That's so exciting. Um, so <laughs> I also want to say thank you, thank you so much, and yay you, and thank you so much to all of you who have been listening, who have been um, enjoying this podcast, and who have also sent in uh, emails to me requesting certain topics and just sharing um, how much the podcast have meant to you, ideas that the podcast has stimulated for you, these conversations that we are having. Um, So thank you so much to all of you who have sent in messages, emails to me. Um, Just so you're aware, I am very much open to hearing um, your points of view, what you got out of the podcast or what you thought about it, how it um, has impacted you in some way, and also any um, topics or um, suggestions on topics that you would like me to talk about. Um, So you can email those in at info at artlifewithkelly, K-E-L-L-I dot com, and um, I'd be happy to read those and get back to you. So on that note, today's 10th episode, we are talking about the S word, selling. We are talking about selling um, your artwork, selling art. Um... And I want to be really careful in this episode because this, well, or not, whatever, we'll just let it flow. (laughs) I can get um, a lot of righteous anger around the stigma of selling and the stigma that artists put on themselves and other artists put on other artists and all that kind of stuff. So it can really, you know, get me going. I can really get on my soapbox when it comes to the topic of selling and specifically around the stigma of selling. But at the end of the day, you know, with these podcasts, really all I want to do is offer you perhaps a different perspective. Um, So I really don't want to just like be ranting on this whole podcast, but I just want to offer you Uh, my perspective, my experience, and what I've learned about selling and about the stigma of selling in hopes that it will help you. Because at the end of the day, the reason why I do get a lot lot of righteous anger around um, the stigma of selling, especially for representational artists, is because I'm like, uh, we need to be more successful artists. We need to, especially, I believe, specifically in representational art and really bringing that back and bringing full strength and full power to that kind of artwork. And so I really want artists to be abundant and thrive, not just survive. And so at the end of the day, that is where my intention comes from, because I think the more that we are abundant artists, the more that we are thriving artists and successful, then of course, the more that this beauty um, and appreciation for art and beauty can be more mainstream in the world, right? And I know I've seen that just in my last, you know, 13, 14 years being an artist that I have seen more and more people um, opening up to even just to, uh, you know, allow themselves to buy artwork because there's been such a stigma around art and buying art and selling art and who buys art, you know, what class are you in to buy art? And it's just such BS, you know, so... Um, The reason why I do get some righteous anger around it is because I know that there's a better way and I know that in the long term, in the long term situation, it's going to make everybody's lives so much better if buying and selling gorgeous, beautiful artwork is just an everyday thing. It's mainstream, right? Okay, so I had a couple of questions that came in. Um, around selling. Uh, One was from Carol and she was asking me specifically like do you ever paint not to sell or does everything that you paint you're painting with the intention to sell it and it's kind of an interesting question. Um, (laughs) It's I 
the only way I can answer this, I think, is like for me personally, I only paint really what I want to paint. I think everybody is doing that. Like you don't really go to the easel and paint things that you don't want to paint. Like you're you're creating what you want to create, period. Um, and so for me, everything that I create, everything that I paint, whether it's a still life, flowers, a self-portrait, a landscape, everything that I create is because I want to create it and I am inspired to create it. And I also believe that somebody on this planet is interested in buying it. <laughs> so, um, but that doesn't, but sometimes like, for example, last week I did a self-portrait. I was feeling really inspired to attempt a self-portrait again. And it was really more out of a place of um, conquering an inner issue that I've always had with self-portraits. And you know what? I did it and I had such a great experience doing it. And um, it served the purpose of what I wanted. I wanted to do a self-portrait so that I could um, prove to myself that I can do this now without falling apart emotionally. Because whenever I was in art school, we, we had to do so many self-portraits. And every single time I did one, I crashed and burned. It was so psychologically <laughs> devastating to me. Uh, to paint a self-portrait. So the purpose, for example, of doing that painting for me was really not the intention of selling it, um, but it was really more for me. Those are more rare situations um, for me, um, but I do not hesitate to just follow that flow, follow that calling, you know, to do work like that if that's what I'm needing, if that's what I'm wanting to do. And um, there's a reason why I'm wanting to do it, right? But I would say 99% of the time, everything that I paint is something I want to create, that I want to see in the world, and I also believe that somebody out there will love it and want to have it and will be willing to buy it. And so I sell uh, all of my work, anything from, you know, sketches to you know, larger, more finished pieces perhaps. I've never discriminated with that because I really don't see a separation. Um, I create a separation marketing-wise on my website from say shorter oil sketches because I can price those lower, they're smaller, um, and my larger paintings, but really I see no separation between them. Art is art, my art is my art, and I really don't see one as being better than the other. Um, it's really just a marketing tool to be able to say, to be able to offer something that is at a lower price point. Uh, for me, that is to help collectors who are just starting their collections or cannot afford a larger piece. Um, so they can have beautiful, amazing art on their wall, whether it's a small sketch or a larger piece. Um, so I hope that helps Carol um, answer that. And then along the, a similar line of thought, um, I had an email that came in from Cindy. And she was asking kind of a similar thing, like how do you balance doing work for yourself and then work that you know will sell? Um you know, in her example in particular, she was saying, you know, like, uh, I have a, basically she sells a lot of still lifes, um, but she also wants to start working on figurative work and portrait work and things like that. And so, um, but she's concerned that if she does portrait work or figurative work, it might not sell as well as a still life work. So to me, it sounds like Cindy already has an audience built for her still life work and um, and perhaps not an audience or she thinks she doesn't have an audience built for her um, figurative work or portrait work. However, that does not mean that you can't sell the figurative work or the portrait work. Um, it also doesn't mean that you can't build an audience that specifically responds to that. Like I have collectors who really love my landscapes and I have collectors who really love my um, still lifes. So yes, for example, if you wanted to transition and do 
a lot more figurative work or portrait work, then you're going to have to put in some time and effort to cultivate that audience, to build that audience base and find where that market is for that genre, perhaps, you know, perhaps. Um, it also could be that your current audience will be very open to that line of work. I'm not sure. I'm not sure how much you have tested this out. I'm not sure how much true factual uh, data that you have or if you're just making an assumption. And this is what we do a lot of the times. We just make an assumption, right? An assumption that, well, you know, people don't like naked figures, so they're not going to buy that, you know. And so a lot of times that's really what it is. So, but if that's not the case, if you actually have true factual data that your current audience is not responding to the figurative work and portrait work, and listen, sometimes it just takes time too to get them to respond, to introduce something new because they're so used to just seeing one thing from you, you know. Um, so it's not impossible, of course. But um, if that is the case, then you're either going to have to give your current audience time to uh, get acquainted with uh, this new genre. Your styles are probably still going to be pretty much the same as far as how you paint, um, your color choices, uh, your strength of composition, all that stuff. Uh, it's not like all of that's going to be totally different. So there's still going to be like a uh, a correlation between the two genres. I believe any artist can paint any genre that they want to, and as long as their artistic voice can is seen as unified among the genres, you know that you're fine. That's fine. Um, it's perfectly good and healthy <laughs> as an artist to be able to do that. Um, so, but you know, you're, you're going to have to give your current audience time to get acquainted with it, or you're going to have to start attracting a new audience by sharing that work, putting it out there without fear of, um, rejection or without fear of losing your current audience. You know, you never want to do anything out of that fear or scarcity mentality. Um, so that, that's my thought on those, those two questions that came in. I definitely hope that um, helps you, Cindy and um, Carol, and everybody else too, because I know that these are things that we can all get hung up on. And the other thing I want to say about all of this is that a lot of these ideas and beliefs, they're really beliefs, um, are very modern beliefs, very modern ideas, you know. Um, especially around selling. And it's interesting to me with the topic of selling, just how stigmatized it is. Um, I recently made a Facebook post and the question was actually, I was asking like, what is the most important thing? What are the important things that you do in your art business? And it was interesting because so many comments came in like, don't, don't paint for the market, don't paint to sell, you know, all this kind of stuff. Um, and I thought, wow, that's really interesting because that had nothing to do with my question, but okay. Um, so there's a stigma around selling, like we shouldn't create to sell. We shouldn't create work that we think is sellable or marketable. Um, and there's always this idea, this very, it sounds so pretty. It sounds so romantic. Really, it does. But it sounds so pretty and so romantic, like, just get good at what you do, you know, just just build that skill set, make the best damn artwork that you can, and that's all you need to do. It's all about merit. It's all about the quality of the work. Just get your technical skill set up, right? And don't worry about the selling. In fact, selling and marketing is like a dirty word. I even had... Um, somebody comment in saying that you couldn't be a good artist if you tried to be good at your art business and sell a market and te you couldn't teach art, be good at art business and sell your work, try to sell your work and be a good artist. Oh my God, what? WTF. <laughs> it's like... This is so mind blowing to me. And actually, I feel so sorry for artists who uh, believe this, who really buy into this uh, myth that you can't be a high quality, talented, making great work artist and be good at business and, you know, teach, for example. 
And if you look through art history, you're immediately going to find that that belief is disproven. You know, my boyfriend Monty and I have been reading this uh, biography on Turner. Um, and it's so interesting because they're, they have all of this evidence of Turner and how he ran his art business. He was so freaking savvy at marketing, networking, selling his own work. I mean, even in his will, he set up uh, to have all of his work be uh, donated to you know the museum there so that he would leave a legacy for himself. Um, one of the examples that they gave in the book was that these artists, you know, in London, they were having a hard time selling their artwork because everybody in London was going over to Italy or to France and they were buying artwork over there. So they were trying to come up with ideas like how do we get people to buy our work? And one of the ideas that they came up with was to sell a subscription service to collectors. So whenever they would come to the show, um, basically, they would get a free etching, which is what today would be like a free print of one of the new paintings that was at the show, right? And they would also basically get uh, first dibs on any of the new paintings in the show in a private viewing before it went you know, public. So if you go back through art history, you see that so many of these artists were so commercially savvy. They were so business savvy and they tried things and they, <laughs> like even I remember reading about Thomas Moran and Albert Bierstadt and how they would get people to fund their projects before they ever went out out west to paint, you know, the great out west. You know, Bierstadt would host shows um, of the new paintings, whenever he would get new paintings, they would charge a mission for people just to come and see the paintings. And then he would, you know, uh, the story goes that he would unveil, the painting would be covered up by a curtain and he would slowly be unveiling that curtain, you know, and telling a story of his adventures in the West um, as the curtain was being unveiling. So he was also a fantastic storyteller and great entertainer. But all of this is business and all of this is marketing, you know, and so they came up with ways to be successful artists financially. So a lot of these, and of course, there's so many more examples than that, you, examples other than those, you know, Picasso, Sargent, um, all these kinds of examples that you can go through and study art history, Michelangelo, oh my gosh, you know. So the point being that those beliefs are kind of a new uh, myth. I think, you know, uh, perhaps it's tied to Vincent Van Gogh, like, oh, I'm going to be like Van Gogh and, and be a struggling artist and suffer for my art. I don't know. I'm not sure when this came into play or when this came into being. But um, this this kind of like this martyr myth or that you're some kind of like pure artist or some kind of art piety if you are just suffering for your art and you're not good at business and you're not good at marketing and if you are then you're not a real artist and you can't possibly make good artwork i mean hello <laughs> this is i make good artwork i teach i make great artwork I'm also still every day learning about how to be a better business owner, a better marketer of my work. It's still a struggle for me to, um, you know, learn what it takes to market my artwork and make sales on my own. So whether or not you you get somebody else to try to sell your work for you, like the galleries, or you participate in collaborations like exhibitions or shows or art fairs, it's all marketing. You are selling. Selling, period, you know. And I think if you're not, or if, if you have, it's really a luxury, you know, uh, this belief that, you know, build it and they will come, just do great work and your work will sell, to me, it's really a luxury cliche. It's a cliche of luxury for um, people who do not, obviously, don't need to make a living as an artist because they can sit around and say things like that. Uh, willy-nilly 
And obviously they don't need to have a steady income coming in because build it and they will come is not a reliable source of income. And merit alone is also not a reliable source of income. I have news for you. It wasn't until three years ago that I started taking courses, studying with mentors and coaches on business to help me that I was, you know, a starving artist, that I was struggling so much financially. It was ridiculous. But nobody was coming to save me. (laughs) The galleries weren't coming to save me. Nobody was coming to save me. Mommy and daddy don't have money. I don't have a rich husband who's running his successful business. You know, so I had to figure it out on my own. And that's why I say these beliefs, they are beliefs of luxury. You obviously don't need to get the money in if you believe these things, <laughs> okay? So, and that's fine. You can choose that. You can choose that belief. You can choose that. Lu- if you have that luxury, you can choose that. And you can you can want to be that kind of artist that doesn't have to sell or market or build their business or network. That's another thing. People call networking, building relationships. It sounds so pretty, but it's networking, y'all. You're networking. (laughs) So anyways, that's an, no, I won't go down that rabbit trail. But the reason why I, the reason why I do get upset about this topic is because I was spoon fed the same BS all through art school. I went through four years of art school and what I was told was, you know, you have to make work that stands out. You have to be so good. Your work has to be so good. And then by the fourth year, after four years of studying and painting and working your ass off to get better at your craft, at the senior show, your senior thesis with your senior thesis statement, these, these, uh, 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 powers that be are going to come up to Connecticut from New York and they're going to swoop up just the most cream of the crop talented students who were there. Okay, guess what happened? Nobody came. Nobody, no, no big, no big doings from New York City came up and swooped anybody up, period. It was a myth. It didn't happen. Now, that's not to say, does it happen to some people sometimes? Sure. Jenny Seville, look at her. You know, sure, I'm sure it does happen, but it's rare. And I am not willing and was not willing to pin my hopes and dreams on rare and build it and they will come and somebody is coming to save me. I wish they were, but it just, no, it's not, it never happened. It didn't even happen ever. So... (laughs) You know, so really um, what I would love to offer you is is to ask yourself if you're willing to let go of that belief. Are you willing to let that go and perhaps have a different perspective, a new perspective? Because as long as you're committed to that belief, you really can't build a true, abundant, and thriving uh, financial business for yourself as an artist. And it is a business, my friends, period. You know, now again, if you are just doing art for fun and you don't want it to be a business, that is totally fine. Make that distinction, make that decision. You know, like, uh, you know, occasionally I'll sell or when the sales come in, that's great, but I don't really want to pursue this as a business. But for those of you who do, for those of you who painting or making art is your livelihood, I encourage you to drop those limiting beliefs and some of those really old, those outdated ideas and beliefs that people have put on artists because about selling because all they do is blame, shame, and and guilt the artists. I mean, even the questions about um, selling, like, do you ever paint not to sell, is kind of loaded with this um, sort of pure idea, like, um, you can't ever have selling in your mind or you're a commercial artist. And the other thing about getting good enough to sell, that's That's not true either because there are so many artists out there who are really good on the business end and their work is really not high quality, but they are selling well and they are selling like hotcakes. I mean, you know, I don't want to, I don't want to knock Bob Ross and uh, Thomas Kincaid, but you know, look at those guys. 
their work is not, I would say, like, you know, top notch, you know, fine artists, but um, their work was good enough and they marketed it and they got good at business and um, that's what they wanted. They wanted to create, you know, uh, uh, well, I don't know that Bob Ross wanted that intentionally, but, you know, they wanted to create that successful, uh, you know, a financial basis for themselves and their work is really not you know super high quality so they marketed their work to the masses especially Thomas Kincaid and had massive success business-wise and financially so you get to decide you know uh, really really you get to put the pieces where you want them to go you get to create your own business and based on your own values but it's really up to you to create that. And we all have free will and we all have the power of that choice. And so, and really we live in the best time right now to be able to do it. So it's really up to you what kind of business you want to create. And I'm going to leave that with you. Um, a great question to ask yourself is, what do I want? What do I want to create with my art? What do I want to create with my art business? Okay, because um, you really need to get clear for yourself and and really shed anybody else's uh, beliefs that have been put on you or any baggage that you're carrying around uh, with that. You know, you're going to have to put that down in order to pick up a new future for yourself, period. <laughs> you can't take all that stuff with you and build a successful, financially successful business for yourself. I can't take limiting beliefs of, you know, well, I don't want to be salesy and build a successful, uh, financially viable business for myself. And so I chose, you know, obviously there's a balance there. I'm not going the Thomas Kincaid route, um, but I chose to build a financially successful art business for myself. I was able to pay off over $50,000 worth of student loan debt a few years ago. I know that I'm going to have a stable retirement income now, that that's what I'm working towards every day. So again, like who's going to do that for me? I'm the only one who can do it for myself. So I'm not going to sacrifice that in order to fit in to other people's limited belief systems and what they think artists should and should not be doing. Okay, my art friends, I hope that this has been helpful to you. I would really encourage you to sit and ask yourself what it is that you really want to create for yourself, for your art, your art business, your life. Get clear on it. Get a direction and start working towards it. Okay, I will see you in the next podcast episode. Again, you can email info at artlifewithkelly, K-E-L-L-I dot com. Let me know what you thought about this episode, any follow-up thoughts or future topics that you would like me to cover. Happy painting, everybody. I'll talk to you soon. Bye.